Great. So we, um, we saw several really interesting case studies. And um, I think uh, one of the things that we see about them is, again, this idea of what do people know. And uh, people, people often spread misinformation, not because they want to. It's just that they mistakenly believe something. And I, I, I mean, just a hypothesis is one of the reasons that the corrections don't spread as much. One, it's not as exciting, right? And two, it's a little embarrassing to admit that you got it wrong that first time, right? So are you going to correct something that you tweeted earlier that it turns out is wrong? I don't know. So maybe you don't want to call attention to that. Um, anyway, so I think um, partly uh, what ties some of these cases together is this idea, again, uh, back to what I like to uh, think about as skill, is what do people really know? And um, in particular, I think here also, this idea that I heard from Ted Strieff uh, specifically about algorithm literacy, right? Because some of the issue, for example, about trending topics and why does something trend, um, it's very much about algorithms and understanding these systems at a deeper level, which most people don't, right? And so um, yet again, we have this issue of lack of skill in an internet-related domain, but how do we get people to be more skilled? Partly we can build better tools, but partly we also need to recognize that they need training. And, one of my big challenges, and just a question I want to throw out there, but obviously we welcome all sorts of comments, is where do we actually teach people how to be better at using the internet? And what's, what's a good uh, point of intervention? Because uh, I think that's a huge challenge. And I'd love to hear people's thoughts on that, either in a group or later, if uh, you want to come to chat with me about that. But I think at this point, uh, we'll open it up and hear reactions to the talks. Yeah, my name is David Scott. I'm a Neiman Fellow here. Uh, I, I, just to touch on your point, and it really speaks to something that's, that's resonating with me throughout all of this, is that um, oftentimes what we're seeing, and especially in Gilad's work, is that journalists are the ones that are amplifying the message, whether it's true or false. And that's what then feeds people to, 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 to re-amplify it and mm -hmm. spread it even further. So it's not glamorous, but I think one of the things that we need to do uh, as a collective is provide journalists with the training they need um, at the basic level to understand how the internet is different and also to provide them with those tools that I'm sure the next panel will get into. Um, hi, George Coe, Harvard College and Politiscape.com. So um, just to touch on your point, um, in our ES21 class, one thing we looked at was um, really the design aspect of the tool you create. Um, can help people explore um, just intuitively. So um, if you actually log on to our developments, uh, our alpha site, which is dev.politiscape.com, you can see a really simple tool we created um, using the uh, similar kind of data clustering that Professor Resnick did. And um, we found out that like by just uh, handing people our uh, development website on our iPad, that um, the simple thing of just touching and like seeing the bars move apart um, gets people excited from a design standpoint of exploration. And so maybe one of the things to tackle um, in terms of the hack day tomorrow is so looking from a design aspect, aspect, maybe with the IDEO Human Centered Design Toolkit um, to figure out how we can use uh, an intuitive, easy to use design to motivate people to explore. Carla. Carla Engel from Progressive Strategies. I wanted to thank you guys for kind of changing the conversation this afternoon, um, at least a little bit, into truthiness, which is not just discrediting misinformation, which is obviously a big problem that we do have out there, that there's a lot of misinformation, but also building a positive um, truth platform. Um, that's what the internet can be and it can be used for. So I wanted to... Um, was one of the things I would say before we started this section, but I'm really excited that we moved into that direction. And I wanted to extrapolate on that for one of the things to throw to the hacks for tomorrow to think about is how do we build that truth platform? How do we amplify it? And how do we reach just outside of our sectors? It was identified today that certain only certain types of people go to factcheck.org and, and other fact checking facilities, and that only certain people want to learn whether they're right or wrong. And those aren't the people that are in this room. Those are the people who are, and I'm sorry, I'm going to take it political, that's what I do, watching Fox News and taking that information, sucking it in as golden, and then repeating it, retweeting it, 
um, putting on Facebook and all of those things. So one of those ideas is how do, I'd like to hear the, hack, the hacks look at how do we create that librarian, Christian, I think that was you or Esther, who brought that up. How do we create the, the librarian for the internet? Um, you know, is it a Yelp for the internet where people are rating truthfulness on, when they Google something? Is it something like that? But that would be a tool on how to use the internet more effectively, how to discredit that information before you read too much of it um, at first glance, and how to work on the self-selecting problem where we look at our, our Google and our Bing and all the other search engine options, and we choose what we read. Well if we saw that some things had been fact-checked already for us, um, or rated in some way, that might change how we do that selection. Can, I, can I respond to that, actually? Yeah, sure, and then I'd like to just go Sure, ahead. yeah, I, I just wanted to, to tie that with the last commenter who I've lost now, but the last commenter um, drew our attention to the media as an intermediary that was very important, and, and your comment really uh, also proposes that we should give more tools to people, in part, this Yelp idea that you have, um, it seems like there's another intermediary that we haven't talked about that much, and that sort of Gilad's talk makes me think about Twitter itself as an inter intermediary, and, and Esther's point of algorithm literacy. Like, could we see tools like the ones we just saw in this panel that were directed not necessarily at the media, although that is important, but also at, say, search engine intermediaries to, to try and do something to empower the users in that regard? Because it doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like this is where this conversation has really gone, and yet this is very important. I'm, I'm thinking here of Ben Edelman's stuff. Like a couple weeks ago, he found that on real estate sites, in order to comply with the Federal Trade Commission rule that ads be labeled, real estate search engines had decided to use the label um, best match to label their ads. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's not a great label for an ad, right? So, okay. Um, so I, I just also wanted to comment. I mean, one thing I find fascinating, for example, with the martinlutherking.org example, is that after all these years, Google still, I mean, we don't know their secret sauce, right? But it seems like that they still continue to take links as sort of equal recommendations, right? I mean, the, the only reason it seems that martinlutherking.org still comes up fairly high is because now a lot of websites point to it an example of a bad site that's mis informing people, right? So why has that code not evolved to understand that not every link is a recommendation, for example? So it seems like there's lots of room at the coding yeah. end. I completely appreciate it's a very complex problem, but it's interesting that it hasn't changed a lot. Yeah. Uh, I'm Bill Adair. I'm the editor of PolitiFact. Um, just wanted to follow up on a couple things that were said. Um, uh, first of all, getting to the idea of things that are true, one, one flaw, I think, in a lot of fact checking is we focus too much on just debunking falsehoods when I think we should be focusing on answering people's curiosity. And so when we, and, and still publish when something's true, and so one of the things we do at PolitiFact is if we find we're curious about something or our readers suggest something to us, we'll fact check it. If we find it's true, we still publish a fact check about it. And some of our colleagues, who we respect a lot in our business, um, don't take that same approach. And I think that's important to do, because otherwise you give this sort of distorted picture that everything's wrong or, you know. And, and I think our, our mission as journalists is to answer people's curiosity. If they hear a political claim and wonder, is that true? We should be answering that. And if it is true, it is. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to follow up on is the idea of, um, I think this was Paul's Paul's point about trying to speed the, the way that we get suggestions about fact checking. And we're working on that. There's some tricks in it. The New York Times has a pretty cool uh, uh, tool that they use on debate nights where you can tweet a suggestion to them and then readers rank it up or down. And that's cool except, as I found one debate recently, there was one claim that had been voted up by a bunch of New York Times readers, and I thought, man, we've got to fact check that one, that's great. And I kept searching and searching and searching, and it had never been said in the debate. So there are, there, <laughs> there is still the need for uh, coming in uh, with uh, a journalist to really assess these things, but we do want to speed up those tools. We find that the most effective one is actually email. We check our email constantly throughout the day, readers are giving us a lot of suggestions, and about one-third of the fact checks that we publish on PolitiFact come from reader suggestions. Thank you, Phil. Um, 
So I, 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 I'm excited about the call for building tools that empower, empower users in various ways. And uh, uh, since we have here two representatives of fact-checking uh, organizations, um, if I may make a nerd comment, maybe this is for the tomorrow section. I'm, I'm sorry I can't be there. But um, if the fact-checking news organizations, experts, reporters, etc., they there was some kind of an API that allowed to build tools on top of their of the information that they they, they, they publish, um, then this would allow you know some of us would like to build tools like Paul and, and Takis and I and many others to latch on to those so we could use them to spread those information, we could use them to match them to misinformation that we can detect on social media, on Twitter. Um, we could use them to, uh, to make it easier for, you know, for crowdsourcing, so for people to match things that they observe to things that, that have been checked. So it seems like there is a bunch of uh, opportunities that would open, and so this is a call to, to action to sort of make it easy for programmatically access fact-checking information. Yeah, sorry, yeah, oh, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> sorry, uh, John Dunbar, the Center for Public Integrity. I just had a couple of broad thoughts that I wanted to get out before this was over with. Um, first, s speed kills accuracy. <laughs> um, I've given up on being first. Uh, it used to be working, for a wi working at a wire service, you were first. Um, now Twitter's first. Um, I, I can't fact check Twitter. I can't fact check somebody's tweet. Um, and, and then the media picks up on the tweets. So you know, what, what are you going to do about that? Make sure your tweet is, I mean, make, check out the tweet and then still not get credit for breaking the story. Um, the other thing that has struck me is that pol policing truth is, that may not be what we're trying to do here, but policing truth is, is like holding back the ocean. I mean, um, we're surrounded by misinformation and, and it's not just the internet, it's everywhere. Um, and that's not to mention the 40% of households in the U.S. that don't even have a, a household internet connection. Um, the other thing that, that struck me is that a lot of the fact-checking movement has really been, well, most of it has been reactive um, by nature. If somebody puts a lie out there and you feel the, the urge to correct it, um, I, I don't feel that urge so much anymore. I think that over, these, over the years, um, of being spun, <laughs> uh, I, I, I look more at uh, the Rick Bermans of the world, and, and this guy has absolutely been outed for years. We, a lot of people know about him. There's, there is this, it's, it's the issue of intent, it's the issue of um, triage. It's like fact triage. You know, if somebody gets the report wrong that somebody said that the NYPD had declared a no-fly zone over a demonstration, I'm not going to put a lot of time into that, but if somebody comes out and basically pushes a propaganda campaign on an issue that's going to affect every man, woman, and child in America, that's probably a high priority. And some of it is um, what I would call pre-propaganda, which is finding out what somebody's agenda is and then educating yourself on it and getting the facts out on the issue before somebody forces the issue. And that's all probably pie in the sky, but it's just wanted to get those out there. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm taking mental note of who's, who's raised their hand. So we have at least four or five people. Yes. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Nick Nikopoulos. So in terms of, of tools, uh, I just kind of want to go back to um, Urs's uh, brilliant typology from earlier today and talk about the, the psychological um, sort of factors uh, approach to tools. So I'm not, uh, I'm not a cognitive psychologist. I'm a computer scientist by training. But in some of my reading, uh, you know, I've learned um, about the elaboration likelihood model of, of cognitive processing and the idea that you, know, you can have uh, central route processing, very deep processing of media information, or more peripheral route processing, which relies on surface credibility cues. And what we know from that research is that uh, the more deep processing that someone does, the more carefully someone reads into something, uh, the less likely they are to be influenced by, by credibility cues. So I'm wondering, from a tool's point of view, what could be done to engender more uh, central route processing? So how do you get people to actually uh, be interested and find something relevant? Because if you can do that, then I think they'll approach it uh, in such a way as to be more critical of it and, and perhaps to, to, uh, 
to have a better understanding of, of, of the material and the quality of the material. I hope someone's keeping track of all the great questions that people are bringing up. Gilad? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to the algorithmic uh, uh, stuff that was uh, said before. And I think it, it's really interesting because the public sort of thinks that algorithms are neutral. You know, it's, it's these classification systems. It's math. It's, it's not somebody's opinion. But the fact that engineers sort of build specific algorithms into our systems that then recommend uh, what we should see, right? So it's the power that goes into these algorithms that's, that's interesting. And the question is, instead of optimizing for, for hot, new, sizzling content that'll grab our attention, which is what the current sort of state-of-the-art algorithms do, can we optimize for an informed public? And how does that algorithm look like, right? And can, can we sit together and, and actually figure out what, like, what that would mean? Because I have no idea what that would mean. Kathleen. Uh, the, uh, we mapped the deceptions across the 2004 and 2008 campaigns from factcheck.org onto a national survey, then looked at Fox Reliant as opposed to other Reliant uh, viewers to determine whether they had accepted the deceptions on their own ideological side and on the other ideological side, and when facts were contested, which they believed. We found it was equally likely for those enclaved into Fox to believe the deceptions on the Republican side as it was on those CNN enclaved in 2004, MSNBC enclaved in 2008. Uh, we didn't see a significant difference in the likelihood by which, you know, of which the, they, they would question the, the materials that were being disseminated uh, from the other side. So the, the, I don't know objectively how much more is out in one media environment than the other, but when you look at the audience response to what's there as mapped against the fact checking, there isn't a difference, Fox Reliant versus CNN Reliant 2008, MSNBC Reliant 2004, 2008. Mike. I'm, I'm curious as to, as to whether uh, the, the topic of Google bombing has uh, been studied by anybody in the room uh, or talked about. I mean, that, that's actually something uh, that, that I've been fairly involved in uh, on, the, on the progressive side of things. Uh, and I, I imagine that the, the Martin Luther King site that you talked about may, may have originally at least risen to the top because of, uh, uh, you know, some campaign by conservatives to make it rise to the top, but, I, but I'm curious whether that effect, ba basically the idea of Google, Google bombing, for those who don't, aren't familiar, is for bloggers or other folks with the ability to uh, move big numbers to, uh, to, to Google bomb certain sites so that they rise to the top uh, uh, over others. And it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, at this point, a fairly common campaign, uh, but we, we do it a lot with, uh, with candidates, for example, if you want, or or with, like if if somebody's lying about something, uh, and we want something that's more factual to go higher up, you you get people to uh, to Google the thing that's more factual, uh, and, and it's a, it, you know it's a fairly common technique, and I'm wondering whether it's been studied by folks who. So I actually edited a special issue of the Journal of Computer Mediated Communication in 2007 that did have some work in it. On that, um, I think Google has responded much more to that since in the last five years, so I don't know if it's as effective. Um, I would also like to add that I don't know if it's completely fair to conservatives in general to suggest that they would Google bomb the Martin Luther King.org site. I mean, I think that's really a white supremacist, sort of really far uh, end of the spectrum community that would be promoting that site. And that's what I've seen just from looking at their linking. Um, Aaron, you had your hand up? Did you still? You had your hand up. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so in trying to think about tools to deal with this stuff, I think it would actually be useful to think about the difference between, say, me and Rick Berman, or between, you know, Kai over at Color Lines and Fox News. Because, you know, I've been called a propagandist. Um, you know, people look at Streets Blog and they say, I mean, literally in like legal documents, I'm referred to as the radical experimental bike lane lobbyist. And, you know, for a lawsuit over a bike lane. And, you know, I think there's a substantial difference between, you know, I, I, for a while I would try to argue that. So, you know, I'm, I'm nothing like a propagandist. And I think in recent years I've come around to this notion that, well, maybe I am doing propaganda, and maybe we all are to some extent, and the sort of the tools of propaganda are just so widely available, and they cost so little now. 
it's just so easy for all of us to do propaganda. So, you know, what is the fundamental difference between someone who's doing advocacy for livable streets and someone who's doing advocacy for the Republican Party? Um, and, you know, because that's what Streets Blog is doing, it's doing advocacy for livable streets, and Fox News is essentially doing it for the Republican Party. And what's the difference in the way that we do that advocacy? And I think in that question lies some sort of answer to the tools or to the kind of code you'd want. And I'll just give you one little example. Um, you know, you can look, you can look and see at Streets Blog who's, pay, who's paying for stuff pretty easily. You can look and see that the people who are writing um, have a long history, so there's a sort of level of authenticity, whereas, you know, Melanie's Rick Berman, he's never done, you know, humane animal stuff before. I think letting people see these sources a little better and the context could really help determine which kinds of, you know, is this good propaganda or bad? Thank you. Did you have, I thought you had your hand up. You, yeah. You didn't have your hand up? Yeah, OK. Yeah, it's very closely related to that. So I don't think we're thinking enough about the reality of the situation, which is that the values shape the facts, all right? And you have to think about that primarily. So if any tool, and, and left and right have different sets of values, and we know what they are, and it's been studied extensively. So if any tool is going to be created, uh, I would think you know it would be great to create algorithms that actually find ways of reframing information. Like you know, you're you're perpetrating this lie, and you think it supports your beliefs, but actually it's completely contrary to everything you believe in. Um, that that's the way to get through is to say that this information which you find so threatening isn't, or this information which you think you must believe you don't, um, because it doesn't really help make you who you are. And. That's what will actually, the only way to change minds. And I think that's what all the psychology research says. So if we could, you know, if just something, something like, in this room, I've heard liberal values expressed many times. Whenever people say big money, who's funding this, special interests. These are all, because we're egalitarian. A lot of people in the room are egalitarian. So you could do algorithms, you could find, and if you find egalitarian values being tied to a, a bit of misinformation, like you do in the vaccine autism issue, where you, you know, people think big pharma is poisoning kids, it actually isn't. But it's their liberal values that make them more inclined to believe that because they distrust big pharma. You could then reprogram and say, no, it's not. This doesn't support your values. Saving the lives of, ch of children is more important than vaccines. Save those lives, and then you would actually start to go through all the psychological steps that you need to get someone to stop believing something wrong. Sasha, did you have your hand up earlier? Yeah. So. I don't, I'm not going to propose this as a solution, but I think it's interesting to have a conversation um, that somehow kind of imagines a bright line separation between uh, what happens online and what happens in other media outlets, right? So we know we have a lot of good information now about the way that information um, flows across channels. And so to talk about how we could counter online misinformation or hate speech or however we're framing it, without talking about what strategies there would be in the broadcast space, I think would be you know, a, a big mistake. Um, we have good metrics that look at how something could be generated and, and spread via a broadcast outlet, and then it gets picked up uh, and constantly repeated in online spaces. And so in that context, you know, what's come up so far um, you know, was a boycott threat potential. But I think in, in the context of talking about martinlutherking.org, we should also remember the possibility uh, in, in other times and spaces of license challenges as another um, strategy that has been extremely effective in the past of restructuring the entire uh, you know, employment practices of, of an industry very successfully, although the license challenge ultimately failed. Um, so that would be something for people to look at, kind of the history of, um, of the 1964 case, Lamar Broadcasting and the United Church of Christ, a key moment in the civil rights struggle. Um, and, and then just to raise the question that um, what are the limits? Presumably there is some limit beyond which the lies or hate speech or disinformation would get so bad that we would agree that uh, we would have to either revoke the, broad, the, the licensee or take it offline. And the classic example there is the uh, genocidal incitement in the case of uh, Rwandan hate speech radio. And so, again, I'm not proposing that the solution is censorship or taking away licenses, but I am proposing that it's difficult for me, at least, to have to have a conversation 
that doesn't also look across multiple platforms and doesn't include um, the full range of political possibility. So we still have a lot of people who have their hands up, but we've run out of time. So I think we're gonna have to move on just so we stay on schedule, I think. <laughs> but thank you very much for uh, all the great comments. Please forgive us. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.